That was the week. March 19th, I think. Keith, is it um, officially spring or are we still a couple of days away? We've got to be a couple of days away because it's pouring down an overcast in Palo Alto and spring, spring, it's usually kind of bumblebees, butterflies and the smell of freshly cut grass. Well, as you can see from the sun shining on my beautiful face, it's sunny in Berkeley. It's always sunny in Berkeley and it's always raining in Palo Alto. Uh, <laughs> and if uh, spring would not be spring without a brilliant essay from, in, at least in Keith Tears' mind, the great Sam Altman, uh, Altman, uh, uh, looking like a young Maurizio Pochettino. Uh, you suggest that Sam Altman is super smart. Who knew? Um, he knew, but I don't know if anybody else did. What, what, what's Sam been up to this week, Keith? Well, interesting enough, in, in the actual newsletter, which I'll show you here, um, I put a, a little wink after who knew because, um, of course, everybody knew. Um, but um, he's done a lot in his short career to date. But he wrote an essay which, you know, honestly, Andrew, it kind of blew me away. Um, the essay is called, um, let me put it up, Moore's Law for Everything. And um, a couple of things drove me to it. The first is, you and I have talked about universal basic income and the end of work and automation quite a bit on this show, but we, I'd never actually seen anybody say anything that was even close to what we were talking about. This essay is a better version, um, and credit for that, uh, of what we've been talking about. Altman goes into, he works at OpenAI, that's his job. And OpenAI is a very, very well-funded, ethical AI foundation seeking to, um, uh, you know, do well, innovate careful, through AI. Uh, there are, in my view, there are many, many problems with this essay. I mean, you're right, it's an interesting one, but I think it's, it's wrong on so many fronts. Firstly, presenting open AI as an open platform, it's a for-profit platform, right? Um, open and for-profit are not incompatible. Um, you know, Ubuntu. So here, here's someone talking about how AI can change the world and redistribute capital and do an, an end with the way the inequalities. And yet the whole thing is just another, it's just a repeat of the old Silicon Valley model of, of, of promising everything and delivering everything to the platform, but to nobody else. Well, well, I think to start with, you've got to give him credit for trying to put his brain into the near future, uh, extrapolating from what he knows. And he, he says there's three things going to happen. The first is massive wealth is going to be created because the price of labor is going to fall towards zero. So that begs the question, who is that wealth going to be for? Um, well, and I have two responses to that. Firstly, I'm not sure he's particularly brilliant and a lot of people have said this before him and secondly wh why is wealth created when the value of labor falls to zero it, most economists would assume that it, it it would undermine wealth because people who own factories people who own companies or products filled with with labor now have a problem well, we don't, to answer that, you have to get into the difference between value and price, which we don't want to bore our listeners too much, so we won't. But the value of a thing is about how much labor is in it, and its price right. is uh, usually related to that, but they deviate, they can deviate. And they deviate when the owners of, as Mark said, the means of production get to set prices unrelated to the true value of the underlying uh, thing. So... Altman is well, and, and, and just jumping in. The idea of true value is another assumption that not everyone would agree with. But anyway, go on. Well, uh, they mean in the economic sense of value, um, which is how many human hours are enshrined in a thing. That's kind of a consensus agreement on what value means. Yeah, but if I write a book that takes, I don't know, 100,000 hours, and Malcolm Gladwell writes a book that takes 500 hours, his is still worth a lot more because he's better than I am. That's price. That's not value. Um, and, we just and, talked and, about pouring labor hours into a product. Yeah, hours is value. Price is, is subject to many other variables. Um, any, anyway, 
what's really important about this this article is it makes the point that the that the cost let's use the word cost the cost of producing things will tend towards zero because of automation and it means software and robotics um and 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 so as the cost tends towards zero um the price should too but it won't unless there's change and so he starts to talk about tax on capital which is a new concept not tax on income but tax on capital which means that the ownership of capital over time will be taken away from private owners and and therefore you can have distribution of outcomes because you get rid of ownership so it it's for a young Silicon Valley capitalist, honestly, I think it, I don't actually know how he got there, but he's arrived at a place which is um, not that different than Marx's utopian vision of a post-work society. Well, I, again, I have two responses to that. Firstly, that this idea has been, been thrown up so many times and it's always wrong in Silicon Valley. Every time the idea, oh, we're going to, you know, drive the price of this or that to zero. And it's never happened. And the assumption that uh, the price of labor has been driven to zero in AI is such a long-term notion. It was believed in the Industrial Revolution that would happen, and it never did. I'll give you an example. Anyway, of what... the argument with AI is that it actually makes the price of some human labor much more valuable. Like I'll give you, you know, an example. AI is never going to be able to produce a show like this. Andrew, Andrew, I'm going to give you an example. Do you remember back in England when you were a kid how many dustbin men used to come around with the, with collecting the garbage? No, I, I accept that argument, and the same can be true probably of self-driving cars, fast food. I, I accept those arguments. It's certainly true in agriculture. Um, and there a lot of lots of things. So right. the, there's no so doubt the, that some of that's true, but that doesn't mean that different kinds of labor and value will be created. I mean, in the same way as the Industrial Revolution resulted in the creation of new kinds of jobs and, and opportunities to create value out of labor, this is what the digital revolution is going to do. I, I just you're, don't understand. You're sounding a little bit like Harold Steptoe, like bar humbug, nothing's going to change, everything's always the same. No, I, I ex no, I'm not saying, I'm saying the reverse. I'm saying that people will... In in the industrial revolution, everyone assumed that uh, that you you get rid of all these jobs in agriculture and there would no longer be labor, but there were new jobs created in factories, and we're going to do the same. Or we are doing the same. There are many new kinds of jobs. I don't know, software developers. I mean, I'm making the traditional Silicon Valley argument that that digital isn't doing away with work or labor or jobs. Well, I think you're your time frame might be too short term when you say that. Uh, yeah, I mean, but the time frame, I mean, if you speak in the, you know, as Kane said, in the long term, we're all dead. I mean, if you're talking about 500 years, who knows what's going to happen? But in well, the next 50, do you really believe, say, in the next 50 years, which is a long time in Silicon Valley, that all these jobs are going to, that, that suddenly. Let's read this quote. Away. Let's read this quote. Right. I bet you don't disagree with any of the sub sentences ai will lower the cost of goods and services because labor is the driving cost in the supply at many levels of the supply i'm not chain. sure i think it depends on the product the good and the service but anyway go on so then so, 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 yeah, robot, let's just use this first example let's say restaurants so it will certainly lower the cost of fast food restaurants because you can have robots making it but it actually will result, I think, it's like in so many other things, the destruction of the middle and the creation of an increasingly sophisticated and expensive high end. So AI isn't going to do away with the cost of goods and services in a high end restaurant. I think what you're doing there, Andrew, is you're, you're not discussing it at the macro level. You're finding micro disagreements. Well, I'm, which I'm are using all... a whole sector, a tourism, uh, uh, entertainment. Uh, well, to tourism, you're going to be able to... Me airplanes medicine, already uh, law, all, all these... AI law will, will be totally AI automated. will certainly lower the middle and create this. It, it's doing the same as is in the, the media business. It's created a well, lot the key, of free the key, content. The key is, 
the key is, will the gross domestic product of the world, which is 85 trillion a year, will it increasingly be produced by non-humans? And at what pace will that happen? And where will it peak? You know, right. what percentage will it peak? You can, you can definitely find things that will be impacted either not at all or slowly, but that's not really the point. The point is, will, will the macro economy of the world be impacted in, in, in a great degree? And I think it will. It, it, it definitely will. And that's a big problem. Uh, you, you do uh, a lot about democracy. Imagine, <clears throat> even if that happens a, a little bit, and um, the productive um, underpinning of society is owned by private individuals who now get massive amounts of wealth without em employing anybody, he's addressing that. And, and in addressing it, he's being a liberal, actually. He's basically saying, how do we save the human race from an undemocratic capitalist elite that benefits from automation at the expense of everybody else? Right, no, and, but, but he seems to be coming up with a solution. Well, so what does he believe? That, 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 that these AI companies like his platform should be nationalized? Um, well, he, do, he thinks that um, I, can, I can actually put it on because it, it's important. He says we should focus on taxing capital rather than labor. And we should use the taxes as an opportunity to directly distribute ownership and wealth to citizens. So what he's really saying is AI is just a tool. It will be applied by companies to making stuff or doing stuff. Um, and um, they'll get very wealthy unless something changes. But well, they have um, got very wealthy, right? Now, I agree with that. And it, so then he's saying, and he says, by the way, this is not a new idea, but it will become feasible as AI grows more powerful. So, he, he, you know, he, he, he talks about improving capitalism. Now, in my editorial, I make the point that he stopped one step short of the logical outcome here, because you can't have capitalism without private ownership of production. And his, his taxing capital actually negates or gets rid of so Private explain when you say tax capital, what, what, what does that mean? It, it means that if you don't employ labor, but you produce things, you should get super taxed. So it's a, a taxation system that punishes people who don't employ. It punishes companies that, that don't employ humans. human beings humans and 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 that that tax yeah, so pays a, for humans pays for humans to have yeah. effectively a universal basic income well it could also pay for companies to employ more people yeah but he's saying that won't happen there'll be no reason to there'll be more leisure time and people will need to live and taxing capital is his way of dealing with it so it really crosses over into the universal basic income discussion I, Honestly, I think it's fascinating, and and I, I definitely don't want to be negative about him because I think he's trying really hard, as a person very influential in AI, to think about the social consequences of its success. Yeah, I re I wrote about um, the, his thing. What is it? Whatever it's called, uh, um, Open AI, which is it's not Open AI. He calls it open AI for one of my books. And this idea of Moore's law for everything, I mean, what, what does that mean? Moore's law is a, a scientific law. Well, How well, um, he's paraphrasing. He mean, it's like an aphorism. He mean, Moore's law is that um, everything will double in some period of time, uh, computing capacity and so on. What he's saying is that AI means that our ability to do things like, let's say, produce cars or airplanes or travel um, or new modes of transport is going to accelerate. It's very similar to what Raymond Kurzweil argues in terms of the singularity, but he doesn't use that word or go that crazy. Mm. Um, so he says the human capacity to produce via automation is going to accelerate to the point where uh, everything can be done 
cheap, more cheaply, more rapidly, and a, a greater range of things can be done. So he's using the Moore's law as a kind of an aphorism to describe all of that. Yeah, I just, you know, this argument's been made now, the same argument for a long time, and it's always been wrong. Um, because there's always new ways for uh, labor to create value. And I think exactly the same thing will happen in AI. I interviewed um, uh, Sherry Turkle this week, you know, the MIT professor. She has a new book out. Yeah. And she's always been the one talking about this sort of added value of certain kinds of human qualities in the age of AI. And I think there's just going to be new jobs, new, new, new sources of value. Now, in the West, I don't know. I mean, in, in, in a country like India, for example, where you have a huge, you know, agricultural labor force. I mean, maybe he has a point, but I mean, this stuff is so abstract and it's so long term. It's like talking about the impact of industrialization in well, 1750 it, or something. He's an insider saying it's going to go faster than anyone realizes. A bit like... You I, know, I think it will, but I think other stuff will also be invented. And, the, and he sort of ignores the... The political dimension or i guess i don't know if he does he does he or doesn't he well uh, no let me come towards your point because i think you've also making a good point the division of labor is is a constant you know ever since human beings stepped outside of caves right we've got better and better and better at doing um things with less labor and therefore allowing us to do more things yeah. And you add population growth into that and the human race has become this amazing creative entity. Yeah. I agree with you that AI is not going to stop human creativity and effort and innovation and, and genius. Um, and and I, th my, I guess he would also agree with you on that. But his point is that much of what we do today will be automated and therefore ultimately almost free tend towards, is the word he uses, will tend towards free, which is a huge opportunity for yeah. civilization, if that's true. Well, let's look at one of the, the paragraph you quoted. We should therefore focus on taxing capital rather than labor. Okay, so I buy that, find that thing. But, and he acknowledges it's not a new idea. It'll be more newly feasible as AI grows more powerful. That there'll be dramatically more wealth to go around. I mean, there's dramatically more wealth to go around now, but it's not going around. Look at America. And, and then he says, the two dominant sources of wealth will be companies, particularly the ones that make use of AI, firstly, and land, which has a fixed supply. But companies are... Yeah, that's where... I, where I, their people the, the companies aren't going to be owned by ai the that, companies that, that's the best actually companies where um, by people like um S S sam altman actually it's where Elon i agree Musk. with you the, be the best ai companies the value of the best ai companies will be because of their labor their, their visionaries their coders their innovators their designers uh, you know an altman uh, um uh, uh, a musk so if anything, I think the value of human labor is going to be the, 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 the problem is that it's only high end human value. Well, so so if you right. read this, yeah, but if you read in my editorial, the paragraph I wrote that follows that, you'll find I agree with you. I, I wrote, I think he's correct, but he also misses the final step. Companies really will not exist once automation is ubiquitous. Taxing capital is the same as socializing wealth. Why the only thing that makes it? capital capital is that it is private. By taxing it, we make it social. And 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 so he, he, wait, 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 wait. let me just come back. You say you just say this stuff, and it's to me it's just absurd. Companies really will not exist once automation is ubiquitous. Why? Because I mean, in the be same way as you could have written in the middle of the 19th century, companies really will, will not exist once industrialization is ubiquitous which it's become and they're still companies you're just going to have ai companies or companies built on new new logic new organization well, new product I, I would say if i would say if you're right we'll be living in some kind of nightmare nightmare world dystopian because 
uh, these there will be very few of these companies owning well, we are massive... now. there are very few companies i mean exactly right. this is what's happened in silicon valley so isn't it amazing isn't it amazing that sam altman who who invested in many of them is saying that shouldn't be our future our future should be taxing capital that to me is amazing i don't think it's amazing well it, i mean it's you'll to be find that all, all the it's people be applauded. Half the people who have cashed in on this are saying the same thing. Um, you go and talk to, I mean, they're the ones who have taken the money off the table and then coming up with all this. But I, I still don't buy it. This idea, companies really will not exist once automation is ubiquitous. They're just going to well, be well, that, well, well, okay, so let's deep down, go down into why that's true. Um, the, the, the centralization of power through owning the tools of automation will be in, intensely antisocial. And Altman's saying it's so antisocial that he personally can't tolerate it. So he wants society to tax capital. I agree with him. And I'm saying if you tax capital, eventually you transfer the ownership of production from private capital to the taxing authority, which is the people. And, and, and so eventually there are no companies. There are just uh, things that, that support yeah, I, people. I just don't buy it. I mean, the, the two most powerful AI companies in the world at the moment are Google and Amazon. And um, I think Google just announced it was employing 10,000 more people this week. Amazon is ramping up. I mean, Amazon seems to employ more people than the U.S. government. So I, I just don't see this. No, but I now mean, again, you're, AI you're being... ubiquitous. And I agree that it's going to result in many huge problems, but I just don't see any evidence that companies, companies are going to be, they're going to well, just going well, to be, we're going to about... more and more multi-trillion dollar companies like Amazon and Google. But you're being, you're being, um, your, your bar is, is driven by empirical evidence, and, and that's hard. Well, can I quote you on that? Your bar is, is created by, well, of course, anyone's bar is. I mean, no, what, no, other, what other criteria empiricism, from empiricism, empiricism methodologically is only useful for analyzing the present. Uh, uh, the minute you're talking about the future, you've got to abandon empiricism and go to extrapolation and logic. Yeah, but you can only anyway that's another question but i i'm trying to use some history and i'm saying that things will change but i just don't see any evidence that companies won't exist companies now the challenge is you're going to have companies and you saw that this week with um amazon companies are so powerful so smart so dynamic that they're actually becoming more effective than government so you saw with Amazon announcing its healthcare stuff, uh, Amazon is becoming the kind of equivalent almost of the NHS in the, U in, the U in the UK in the US, except it's a privatized NHS. Yeah, yeah, anyway, I, I, it's good. I, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's I, stimulating. I agree. I mean, he's definitely he's a big thinker, Altman. That's fair, and he's thinking in in broad historical terms. And um, and uh, and I thought I didn't like him, but I now like him. You like him because he's a sort of romantic Marxist of the German ideology kind, who still believes that we technology is going to save us. Well, it's going to do something, and whether we save it saves us is a human question. <laughs> uh. <laughs> well, no, if it's a human question, then then AI isn't as important as you say it is. But it is important and interesting. And um, you know, I was talking to uh, I was talking to uh, to Sherry Turkle. who has got this new, really good new book out called um, uh, the What's it called? The uh, the uh, the uh, uh, It begins with E. The diaries. The you know when you're a sympathetic, um, empathetic, is, the empathy diaries. Oh. Um, and she's, you know, she's always the one who's been thinking about AI and empathy and our relations with AI. And it was the New York Times book of the week this week with another book by Ishiguro, Clara and the Sun, which is about 
um, which is another really interesting book, which is about um, AI. It, it's it's narrated or, or, or written from the point of view of an AI that's trying to be sympathetic to human beings. So I think in that sense, I agree with you. The, the future is arriving. The fact that Ishiguro, one of the world's leading novelists, he won the Nobel Prize, is writing about AI in, in a very down-to-earth sense suggests that this is not science fiction anymore. It's real. Yep, and it's becoming more real. I, I, as you know, Andrew, in my day job, I work with a lot of startups. This is your day job, Keith. I hope you don't have another day job. This is my Friday day job, but um, the rest of the week I work with companies and without giving away any names of companies, the conversation about automation to reduce cost is um, is a huge conversation inside those companies. Oh, it's massive. But and, and I'd like to come back to this, but I just see so many new. And in this sense, I think I'm the opposite of, of, of Harold Steptoe, the rag and bone man. I believe that there'll be new jobs created. Um, I, I just accused you of that. Be be enough. The, the question is, are, are there going to be enough? So there's always going to be for work for guys like you and I. There's always going to be work, obviously, for the Sam Altmans of the world. But can we create a middle a, a middle class labor force? And it's like the entertainment industry. We created a high end entertainment well, aristocracy in the digital economy. We created a, a huge underclass of free stuff. But there's nothing in between. I, I think the only word that we should drill down on in future shows is the word labor force. Because I, I, labor force implies, you know, a, a salary from, from an employer. And I think a future in which you get enough from society to live on and you can write and record and publish as much as you want is a more likely future than one where you're paid a well, salary. By... Thing, it's, it's life after, ca I mean, it's the world after capital. Albert just wrote a book about it. But I've yeah. just you know, it's been a huge hoo-ha in the U.S., about a, a, a stimulation deal, uh, a stimulus deal, not stimulation, that was a Freudian era, Stimu stimulus deal, where it's 1.9 billion and everyone gets a check for what? Well, most people, not you, but normal people get checks for $1,200. And that's, you know, that's a one-time thing because of COVID. So I just, yeah. again, I just don't see it. And it's required a massive... Did you, um, did you look at the... Uh, you probably haven't had time, but did you see that the city of Stockton reported on its UBI? Yeah, I saw that. It's interesting. And and it was... Every single trend was posi human positive. I think one of the other stories this week that sort of touches on this is this increasing clash between, shall we call them AI companies, because they are, and state. So yeah. one of the areas that trillion dollar or near, near trillion dollar AI companies now are getting into is digital currency. And of course, Facebook wants to create, and Facebook is, I think Zuckerberg has even said it, Facebook is an AI company, or he wants it to become an AI company. And Facebook now is trying to develop its own currency. And the EU, which isn't a nation state, it's a super nation, national state, is pushing that. So what's the story there, Keith? It's a bit of an old story, but it's taking it on a new form. Um, uh, Facebook, which uh, originally said it was going to produce a currency called Libra, that currency is now called Diem. And um, it's uh, very different to the original vision, uh, but it's still a digital currency that can be traded between people on Facebook for products and services. And the European Central Bank... Uh, um, you know, uh, or uh, sorry, not the central bank. A European member of Parliament, Stefan Berger, from the uh, the uh, he's a member of something called the European People's Party, went on the record to say uh, Facebook will become a central bank if it's allowed to do this. And it's it's interesting because it, this is the same week that Morgan Stanley finally said it's going to allow its clients to access Bitcoin funds. Mm. And um, it's also the week in which Roblox has been a public company for a week. There's a great story about Roblox being of digital currencies and the creator economy, which we've talked about before. Mm. So, so it's all about value escaping nation state control. That, that's the common theme between all of them. But and, you know, we have had and also stories of, I think it's the Indian government creating or 
wanting to create its own digital currency. So the nation state is, and supranation states are pushing back on this stuff. Well, yeah, it's two separate things that use a common word, digital currency. But actually, from a from the point of view of the future of human civilization, they're very different things. A nation state digital currency is just a digital version of the coins and papers we carry around. And nation states still print them and control them. There's this overlay economy, a little bit like what streaming did to broadcast TV. There's this overlay economy now driven by assets that are not printed and published by nation states or accounted for by them. And, and, and you know, that, that is leading to lots of angst in nation state capitals and central banks, because if they don't know about it and can't control it, they can't tax it. And over time, if it's more attractive to use those, those uh, assets for either savings or for exchanging, um, what's the role of a nation state anymore? Well, meanwhile, there is a role of the nation state, um, even when it comes to defining labor. One of your other stories of the week is a compromise, maybe not to everybody's satisfaction, on this issue of whether or not Uber drivers are employees. So this stuff, you, you talk about thinking about the future. I, I agree in the very long term, maybe some of this stuff's for real. But in the short term, we're still arguing about labor and the responsibility of companies. And it's nation states making decisions on it, like in the UK, with in, in terms of Uber drivers, right? Yeah, well, it's, so it's, it's actually really interesting because there used to be two possible things that Uber drivers were, employees or self-employed. There's now a third thing. It's called, uh, the Uber calls them workers. So, so Uber isn't agreeing that they're employees. Um, and it's also not saying that they're self-employed. It's saying they're workers. And as workers, they will get some rights like holidays and um, minimum guarantees and stuff. But they won't have all the rights of an employee. And so it feels as if this is actually a, a quite a big compromise on both sides. Um, to, uh, and it does go back to our Sam Altman discussion because if employment is going to be replaced by something else, it won't happen all at once. There'll be, you know, there'll be hybrid and interstitial moments. It feels like this Uber thing is an interstitial moment. Yeah, I agree. And I think what's really interesting with Uber in 25 years' time is whether they'll have any drivers or whether they'll be self-driving cars. Again, another subject, a subject for another week. Your startup of the week is another... Um, uh, growing AI company. I don't know if that would be fair. Stripe. I mean, how would you define Stripe? Well, firstly, it's it, it was St. Patrick's Day this week, so I had to pick an Irish company. Um, uh, they're they're American uh, as a company, but the two lads who the brothers who founded it are Irish, uh, and this week they raised money at a valuation of ninety five billion dollars. Uh, yeah. Their their net worth is about 11 billion each as a result they're smart. of that. Uh, they're very smart, right? Um, so Stripe is my startup of the week because it is still a startup. It's a private company. I use it. If you uh, if you are so minded, go and pay me either $9 a, a month or $90 a year for my newsletter. Stripe will be collecting that from you and keeping you know some single digit percent of it for themselves. And they're doing that a lot. So it's a very, very... Big. As a plumbing company, do you see Stripe more as a, pl a financial plumbing company than an AI company? It, plumbing's a good, you know, if, if you've ever had a water leak and you call a plumber, it isn't cheap, right? Yeah, I don't so, mean that in a majority sense. Yeah, they are a plumbing company. They glue together buyers and sellers and do all right. the stuff in the middle. Yeah, these plumbing companies are valuable. Did you see, uh, maybe we'll do all this next week, Played, that lost its deal with Visa, the $5 billion deal with Visa. Um, because uh, because the government objected now is raising money at a valuation of ten or fifteen billion. So uh, the government can push back on its on its acquisitions, but it's not stopping these 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 plumbing companies becoming ever more valuable. Finally, tweet of the week, which I think proves my argument about the value of human labor. Clubhouse. What's the problem with Clubhouse? And hopefully, this will be the last time we ever talk about Clubhouse because it's a piece of shit. 
<laughs> Andrew, you, for such a sophisticated gentleman, you have a turn of phrase on well, that. That's uh, it's for my as sophisticated as I can get about it. So this is uh, Sean Puri, who I actually didn't know before seeing this yeah. tweet, um, and he's got it's not just one tweet; it's um, probably a thirty-minute read. If you, it's lots of tweets as a as a story about why Clubhouse will fail, and I've pulled out just one uh, scenario here where he said. Uh, they ship a recording feature and it flops. Creators care more about the recording, so they stop inviting random audience members and the fun of live is gone. Uh, uh, so the listeners then say, what's the point of showing up live when you can just listen to the podcast later? Which, funnily enough, happened this week. Josh Constein, formerly of TechCrunch, now of Signal Fire, interviewed Mark Zuckerberg, Daniel Ek, and the CEO of Shopify last night on Clubhouse. And today, he published it as a podcast with a transcription, which means we didn't miss out by not being on Clubhouse. Well, the whole point of Clubhouse, isn't it? You can raise your hand and ask questions. Uh, you can raise your hand and ask questions. The microphone can change hands. Uh, someone interesting yeah, in the this audience. This can... comes back to we're ending on 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 a on a Sam a Sam Altman note. It comes back to again the the value of human beings or the creation. There's no better example of how AI is not going to replace humans when it comes to the creation of content. And well, Sam, you know, Sam, Sam doesn't. Clubhouse is it's so boring, right? The content on it, it's like. VCs talking. Who would wants to listen to VCs? <laughs> well, hope, hopefully um, a small number of people do. Well, I'm, you're not right. I don't consider you a VC. But well, I was going to say, Andrew. Is, isn't there a, an element of um, justice that, you know, Andreessen Horowitz backed this thing, thinking it could become a content company, and it's realizing that you can't just become a content company because you've got money. Well, to your point, what Clubhouse is doing well is shining a light on the interest of good conversation. So it's boring when it's boring, but when it's good, it's really good. And, and there's a difference between the two. Um, and Altman, by the way, is a supporter of creating time for humans to do things like that rather than paid labor. So he's not against humans. He's yeah, for humans. I mean, uh, to, uh, let me defend, uh, say, someone like uh, uh, Albert Wenger, the, 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 my friend at uh, Union Square Ventures. He wrote a book. Uh, what is it? The World After Capital. It doesn't seem as if Altman's saying anything different. He probably just read Albert's argument. Uh, uh, original, you know, what he's saying. But uh, I, it wouldn't surprise me if that was true. Uh, Albert is an incredibly smart man who has been well ahead of this curve. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, it's not Sam Altman who is saying he's super smart. It's Keith Tier. So any criticism, if Sam Altman's work, watching this, Sam, don't take it personally. Criticize Keith because you are in his fan club, and I suspect it's because you are a protege of Keith's ultimate hero, Paul Graham. Is that fair, Keith? I thought you were going to say Karl Marx. Thank God he said Paul Graham. <laughs> that was the week for March 19th. Next week, maybe we can talk about Karl Marx as being super smart. Have a great week, Keith, and we'll talk again next week. Thank you.